What exactly is meant by the term organizational behavior, and why should it be studied? Answers to these two fundamental questions will help you better appreciate organizational behavior as a field and can be of value to you in your future. Let's take a look. Organizational behavior, or OB, is the study of human behavior in organizational settings, of the interface between human behavior and the organization, and of the organization itself. Although we can focus on any one of these three areas, we must also remember that all three are ultimately necessary for a comprehensive understanding of organizational behavior. This figure illustrates this view of organizational behavior. It shows the linkages among human behavior in organizational settings, the individual organization interface, the organization itself, and the environment surrounding the organization. Each individual brings to an organization a unique set of personal characteristics and unique personal background and set of experiences from other organizations. Therefore, in considering the people who work in their organization, managers must look at the unique perspective each individual brings to the work setting. But individuals do not work in isolation. They come in contact with other people and with the organization in a variety of ways. Points of contact include managers, co-workers, formal policies and procedures of the organization, and various changes implemented by the organization. In addition, over time, individuals change as a function of their personal experiences and mastery as well as through work experiences and organizational development. An organization, of course, exists before a particular person joins it and continues to exist after he or she leaves. Thus, the organization itself represents a critical third perspective from which to view organizational behavior. The core of OB is being effective at work. Understanding how people behave in organizations and why they do what they do is critical to working effectively with and managing others. Organizational behavior gives everyone the knowledge and the tools they need to be effective at any organizational level. Organizational behavior is an important topic for anyone who works or will eventually work in an organization, which is the case for most people. Moreover, OB is actually important to us as individuals from numerous perspectives. Organizations as a whole also benefit from OB. Imagine the difference between a company with motivated, engaged employees with clear goals aligned with business strategy, and one with unhappy employees, a lot of conflict, weak leadership, and a lack of direction. OB also helps organizations perform well. A mounting body of evidence shows that an emphasis on the softer side of business positively influences bottom line results. By listening to employees, recognizing their work, building trust, and behaving ethically, managers have boosted performance. Organizational behavior is not a defined business function or area of responsibility similar to finance or marketing. Rather, an understanding of OB provides a set of insights and tools that all managers can use to carry out their jobs more effectively. The managerial context of organizational behavior can be viewed from the perspective of basic management functions, critical management skills, and overall human resource management. In characterizing managerial work, most educators and other experts find it useful to conceptualize the activities performed by managers as reflecting one or more of four basic functions. Let's take a look. Organizations use many different resources in the pursuit of their goals and objectives. As with management functions, though, these resources can be generally classified into four groups, human, financial, physical, and or information resources. Planning, the first managerial function, is the process of determining the organization's desired future position and deciding how to best get there. Organizational behavior processes and characteristics pervade each of these activities. Perception, for instance, plays a major role in environmental scanning, and creativity and innovation influence how managers set goals, strategies, and tactics for their organization. The second managerial function is organizing, the process of designing jobs, grouping jobs into manageable units, and establishing patterns of authority among jobs and various job groups. This process produces the basic structure or framework of the organization. Leading, the third major management function, is the process of motivating members of the organization to work towards the organization's goals. 
major components of leading include motivating employees, managing group dynamics, the actual process of leadership itself, and so on. They are all closely related to the major areas of organizational behavior. The fourth managerial function, controlling, is the process of monitoring and correcting the actions of the organization and its people to keep them headed towards their goals. Performance evaluation and reward systems, for example, both apply to control. Control is of vital importance to a business, but it can be especially critical to smaller organizations. Managers apply these four basic functions across resources to advance the organization towards its goals. In general, most successful managers have a strong combination of technical, interpersonal, conceptual, and diagnostic skills. Technical skills are necessary to accomplish specific tasks within an organization. Managers use interpersonal skills to communicate with, understand, and motivate individuals and groups. Managers spend a large portion of their time interacting with others, so it's clearly important that they get along well with other people. Conceptual skills are the manager's ability to think in the abstract. A manager with strong conceptual skills is able to see the big picture. That is, she or he can see the opportunity where others see roadblocks and problems. Most successful managers also bring diagnostic skills to the organization. Diagnostic skills allow managers to better understand cause and effect relationships and to recognize the optimal solutions to problems. Management skills impact organizational behavior and success in profound ways. Human resource management, known as HRM, is the set of organizational activities directed at attracting, developing, and maintaining an effective workforce. More precisely, HR managers select new employees, develop rewards and incentives to motivate and retain those employees, and create programs for training and developing staff. But how do they know which applicants to hire, and how do they know which rewards will be more motivating than others? The answers to these and related questions are generally drawn from the field of organizational behavior. Competitive advantage exists any time an organization has an edge over rivals in attracting customers and defending itself against competition. How does an organization gain competitive advantage? Sources of competitive advantage, including having a best made or cheapest product, providing the best possible customer service, being more convenient to buy from, having shorter product development times, and having a well-known brand name. According to Michael Porter, to have a competitive advantage, a company must ultimately be able to give customers superior value for their money, either a better product that's worth a premium price or a good product at a lower price can be a source of competitive advantage. A company may create value based on price, technological leadership, customer service, or some combination of these and other factors. Business strategy involves the issue of how to compete, but it also encompasses the strategies of different functional areas of the firm, how changing industry conditions such as deregulation, product market maturity, and changing consumer demographics will be addressed, and how the firm as a whole will address the range of strategic issues and choices that it faces. Business strategies are partially planned and partially reactive to changing circumstances. A large number of possible strategies exist for any organization, and an organization may pursue different strategies in different business units. Companies may also pursue more than one strategy at a particular time. These three primary business strategies are cost leadership, differentiation, and specialization. Let's take a look. Firms pursuing a cost leadership strategy strive to be the lowest cost producer in an industry for a particular level of product quality. These businesses are typically good at designing products that can be more efficiently manufactured and engineering efficient manufacturing processes to keep production costs and consumer prices low. A differentiation strategy calls for the development of a product or service with unique characteristics valued by customers. The value added by the product's uniqueness may enable the business to charge a premium price for it. The dimensions along which a firm can differentiate include image, like Coca-Cola, product durability, like Wagner clothing, quality, like Lexus, safety, like Volvo, and usability, like Apple Computer. 
Businesses pursuing a specialization strategy focus on a narrow market segment or niche, a single product or a particular end use or buyers with special needs, and pursue either a differentiation or cost leadership strategy within that market segment. Successful businesses following a specialist strategy know their market segment very well. They will often enjoy a high degree of customer loyalty. This strategy can be successful if it results in either lower costs than competitors serving the same niche, or the ability to offer customers something other competitors do not, like manufacturing non-standard parts. There are a number of significant linkages that connect business strategy and organizational behavior. For instance, a firm that relies on cost leadership strategy will usually need to keep all of its expenses as low as possible. Therefore, this strategy might indicate relying on low wages for employees and trying to automate as many jobs as possible. Strategy implementation and strategic change also require large-scale organizational changes. Two of the largest may be new organizational culture and new behaviors required of employees. Formal study of organizational behavior began in the 1890s, following the industrial relations movement spawned by Adam Smith's introduction of the division of labor. In the 1890s, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth and Frederick Winslow Taylor identified the positive effects of precise instructions, goal settings, and rewards on motivation. Their ideas became known as scientific management and are often considered the beginning of the formal study of organizational behavior. Scientific management is based on the belief that productivity is maximized when organizations are rationalized with precise sets of instructions based on time and motion studies. The four principles of Taylor's scientific management are the following. Replace rule of thumb work methods with methods based on scientifically studying the tasks using time and motion studies. Scientifically select, train, and develop all workers rather than leaving them to passively train themselves. Managers provide detailed instructions and supervision to workers to ensure that they are following the scientifically developed methods. They divide work nearly equally between workers and managers. Managers should apply scientific management principles to planning the work, and workers should be actually able to perform the tasks. Although scientific management improved productivity, it also increased monotony at work. Scientific management left no room for individual preferences or initiative and was not always accepted by workers. The scientific method spawned the discovery of the Hawthorne effect in the 1920s and 1930s. The Hawthorne effect occurs when people improve some aspect of their behavior or performance simply because they know they're being assessed. The Hawthorne effect was first identified when a series of experiments that came to be known as the Hawthorne Studies were conducted on Western Electric Plant workers in Hawthorne, just outside of Chicago, to see the effects of a variety of factors, including individual versus group pay, incentive pay, breaks, and snacks on productivity. One of the working conditions tested at the Hawthorne plant was lighting. When they tested brighter lights, production increased. When they tested dimmer lights, production also increased. Researchers observed that productivity almost always improved after a lighting change, any change, but eventually returned to normal levels. Workers appeared to try to work harder when the lights were dimmed just because they knew they were being evaluated. George Elton Mayo, founder of the Human Relations Movement, initiated by the Hawthorne Studies, explained this finding by saying that workers tried harder because of the sympathy and interest of the observers. Mayo stated that the reason workers are more strongly motivated by informal things is that individuals have a deep psychological need to believe that their organization cares about them. Essentially, workers were more motivated when they believe their organization is open, concerned, and willing to listen. The Hawthorne studies prompted further investigation into the effects of social relations, motivation, communication, and employee satisfaction on factory productivity. 
Rather than viewing workers as interchangeable parts in mechanical organizations as the scientific management movement had done, the human relations movement viewed organizations as cooperative systems and treated workers' orientations, values, and feelings as important parts of organizational dynamics and performance. The human relations movement stressed the importance of human dimensions of work, including group relations that can be superseded by organizational norms and even an individual's self-interest. Harvard social work professor and management consultant Mary Parker Follett was known as the prophet of management because her ideas were ahead of her time. Follett discovered a variety of phenomenon, including creativity exercises such as brainstorming and the groupthink effect of meetings. W. Edwards Deming is known as the guru of quality management. Deming taught Japanese industrialists statistical process control and quality concepts. His classic 1986 book describes how to do high-quality, productive, and satisfying work. Deming believed that removing fear from the workplace gives employees pride in their worksmanship and increases productivity. Deming also felt that when things go wrong, there's a 94% chance that the system, elements under management control, including machinery and rules, rather than the worker, is the cause. He believed that making changes in response to normal variations was unwise, and that proper understanding of variation includes the mathematical certainty that variation will normally occur within a certain range. The total quality management movement initiated by Deming again highlights the importance of people, teamwork, and communication in organizations' success. This brief history helps to set the stage for an understanding of organizational behavior. A system is an interrelated set of elements that function as a whole. This figure shows a general framework for viewing organizations as systems. According to this perspective, an organization system receives four kinds of inputs from its environment, material, human, financial, and informational. The organization's managers then combine and transform those inputs and return them to the environment in the form of products or services, employee behaviors, profits and losses, and additional information. As outputs, these products are sold to the consuming public. Profits from operations are fed back into the environment through taxes, investments, and dividends. Losses, when they occur, hit the environment by reducing stockholders' incomes. Then the system receives feedback from the environment regarding those outputs. Finally, information about the company and its operations is also released into the environment. The environment, in turn, responds to those outputs and influences future inputs. The system's perspective is valuable to managers for a variety of reasons. The system's perspective helps managers conceptualize the flow and interaction of various elements of the organization itself as they work together to transform inputs into outputs. The situational perspective suggests that in most organizations, situations and outcomes are influenced by other variables. The field of organizational behavior has gradually shifted from a universal approach in the 1950s and early 1960s to a situational perspective. In the earlier days of management studies, managers searched for universal answers to organizational questions. They sought prescriptions, the one best way that could be used in any organization under any conditions. Eventually, however, researchers realized that the complexities of human behavior and organizational settings make universal conclusions virtually impossible. They discovered that in organizations, most situations and outcomes are contingent, that is, the precise relationship between any two variables is likely to be situational, as an example dependent on other variables. The situational perspective has been widely documented in the areas of motivation, job design, leadership, and organizational design, and it's becoming increasingly important throughout the entire field of organizational behavior. First presented in the terms of interactional psychology, this view assumes that individual behavior results from a continuous and multidirectional interaction between characteristics of the person and characteristics of the situation. More specifically, interactionalism attempts to explain how people select, interpret, and change various situations. Note that the individual and the situation are presumed to interact continuously. 
This interaction is what determines the individual's behavior. The interactual view implies that simple cause and effect descriptions of organizational phenomena are not enough. Other studies may propose that attitudes influence how people perceive their jobs in the first place. Both positions probably are incomplete. Employee attitudes may influence job perceptions, but these perceptions may in turn influence future attitudes. The interactual view appears to offer many promising ideas for future development. They can do this by enhancing behaviors and attitudes, promoting citizenship, minimizing dysfunctional behaviors, and driving strategic execution. First, several individual behaviors result from a person's participation in an organization. One important behavior is productivity. A person's productivity is a relatively narrow indicator of his or her efficiency and is measured in terms of products or services created per unit of input. Performance, another important individual level outcome variable, is a somewhat broader concept and is made up of all work-related behaviors. Even if all the people in a group or team have the same or similar attitudes towards their jobs, the attitudes themselves are individual level phenomenon. Individuals, not groups, have attitudes. Managers need to assess both common and unique outcomes when considering individual and group levels in organizational behavior. Levels of job satisfaction or dissatisfaction Organizational commitment and employee engagement play an important role in organizational behavior. Extensive research conducted on job satisfaction has indicated that the personal factors, such as an individual's needs and aspirations, determine this attitude, along with group and organizational factors, such as relationships with coworkers and supervisors, as well as working conditions, work policies, and compensation. A satisfied employee also tends to be absent less often, to make positive contributions and to stay with the organization. In contrast, a dissatisfied employee may be absent more often, may experience and express stress that disrupts coworkers, and may be continually looking for another job. Contrary to what many managers believe, however, high levels of job satisfaction do not necessarily lead to higher levels of performance. A person with a high level of commitment is likely to see himself or herself as a true member of the organization, to overlook minor sources of dissatisfaction with the organization, and to see herself remaining a member of the organization. In contrast, a person with less organizational commitment is likely to see himself as an outsider and to express more dissatisfaction about things, and not to see himself as a long-term member of the organization. Organizational citizenship is the behavior of individuals that makes a positive overall contribution to the organization. The determinant of organizational citizenship behavior is likely to be a complex mosaic of individual, social, and organizational variables. The social context in which the individual works or the work group will need to facilitate and promote such behaviors. And the organization itself, especially its culture, must be capable of promoting, recognizing, and rewarding these types of behaviors if they are to be maintained. Although the study of organizational citizenship is still in its infancy, preliminary research suggests that it may play a powerful role in organizational effectiveness. Some work-related behaviors are dysfunctional in nature. Dysfunctional behaviors are those that detract from, rather than contribute to, organizational performance. Two important dysfunctional, individual-level behaviors are absenteeism and turnover. Absenteeism is a measure of attendance. Although virtually everyone misses work occasionally, some people miss far more often than others. Some look for excuses to miss work and call in sick regularly just for some time off. Others miss work only when absolutely necessary. Turnover occurs when a person leaves the organization. If the individual who leaves is a good performer, or if the organization has invested heavily in training that person, turnover can be costly. Other forms of dysfunctional behavior may even be more costly for the organization. Theft and sabotage, for example, result in direct financial costs for the organization. 
Sexual and racial harassment also cost an organization, both indirectly by lowering morale, producing fear, and driving off valuable employees, and directly through financial liability if the organization responds improperly. So too can politicized behavior, intentionally misleading others in the organization, spreading malicious rumors and similar activities. Incivility and rudeness can result in conflict and damage the morale of the organization's culture. Bullying and workplace violence are also growing concerns in many organizations. Violence by disgruntled workers or former workers results in dozens of deaths and injuries each year. The factors that contribute to workplace violence are difficult to pin down, but of obvious importance to managers. The answer is that common sense isn't so common. People don't always agree. If 10 people see the same leadership interaction, you may have 10 different common sense perspectives on what leadership is and how it works. Even if you don't find 10 different perspectives, you'll certainly not find perfect agreement to the same phenomena. Another answer is common sense isn't always right. Findings may seem like common sense after research is done, but beforehand, we don't really know what's going on. So it isn't just common sense. We need science and research because it's built on careful and systematic testing of assumptions and conclusions. This process allows us to evolve our understanding of how things work, and it allows us to learn when goals, confidence, satisfaction, cohesion, and rewards affect outcomes and why it happens. That's why you need to learn the theories and why you can't just operate on common sense. Organizational behavior is the study of human behavior in organizational settings, of the interface between human behavior and the organization, and of the organization itself. Although we can develop a good understanding of many of the norms, expectations, and the behaviors of others by living and working with people, there are many things that are not well understood without more systematic study. Decades of research have both reinforced some of the things many people inevitably believed and identified as common misunderstandings or misconceptions about organizational behavior. Rather than relying on experience or intuition, or just assuming that ideas are correct because they seem to make sense, the scientific method relies on systematic studies that identify and replicate a result using a variety of methods, samples, and settings. The scientific method, as you see here, begins with theory, which is the collection of verbal and symbolic assertions that specify how and why two or more variables are related and the conditions under which they should and should not relate. Theories describe the relationship that are proposed to exist among certain variables, when and under what conditions. Until they are proven to be correct, theories are no guarantee of fact. It is important to systematically test any theory to verify that its predictions are accurate. The second step in the scientific method is the development of a hypothesis or written prediction specifying expected relationships between certain variables. Hypothesis testing can be done using a variety of research methods and statistical analysis. For our purposes, assume we collect data on our predictor or independent variable and our criterion or dependent variable. We can then analyze the correlation, observed R, between the two variables to test our hypothesis. The correlation reflects the strength of the statistical relationship between two variables. Rather than answering the question with a yes or no, the correlation answers how strong the relationship is. A statistical technique called meta-analysis is used to combine the results of many different research studies done in a variety of organizations and for a variety of jobs. The goal of meta-analysis is to estimate the true relationship between various constructs and to determine whether the result can be generalized to all situations or if the relationship works differently in different situations. <laughs>